This is the podcast for H.J. Chapman Freelance Law Practice. On Saturday the 11th of May 2013, I was lucky enough to be invited to give a talk to 20 or so MBA students at the University of New York in Prague, together with Albert Balladini and Jana Volkova. Albert Balladini has completed law school in the United Kingdom and currently works for Richcliffe Consultancy, a substantial property developer active in Central Europe and the United Kingdom. Jana Volkova is an advocate qualified in the Czech Republic who works for renowned constitutional law firm Tom and Devati and Partners. And the details about me, Howard Chapman, are available on my website www.hjchapman.com. As regards this session, the group was highly energetic and engaged throughout the day's worth of presentations where we sought to explain the basics of certain legal concepts and the ways that lawyers can be used to help their businesses grow. We have reproduced all of the talks as a series of short audio streams. In case you were not at the talk, we hope this is the next best thing and in any case we hope this is useful to you. So on with the show. My subject is um, M&A transactions, which gives me a chance to bring together some of the concepts that Albert's been talking about in, in a legal sense. And a lot of them will apply simultaneously in what basically amounts to the most fundamental acts in the life of a company. And the slang word that is given to that is M&A, which is mergers and acquisitions, but it, it's more perhaps than just a merger and an acquisition. And just using sort of just common sense, I guess, about how what, what might that be? Well, you've got the birth of the business or the company, the death, the you know, buying or selling shares or assets, or, or maybe you're even talking about key rights or key obligations or key people. And so this broadly is what I mean when I'm talking about transactions what are the transactions that are the, really the material parts of the company's life? So when you talk about contract law, uh, the, the concepts that Albert was talking about, you're talking about bank loans, you're talking about security, shareholder agreements, these are all what I would call M&A, you'd expect an M&A lawyer to deal with that, the key men, perhaps the, the employees of the company that are really material to the business, without them you can't do without it, the managers, the directors, you're looking at uh, corporate law as regards the directors. Uh, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about transactions. I'll try to explain some of the jargon. If I don't, please feel free to stop me. The first jargon is the word M&A, which is the first word of the whole presentation. <laughs> but uh, I do my best. Uh, so you yeah. first M&A is the actual... Or no, it's commonly or is it used. Like you are no, it's uh, it's commonly used in the in the legal profession. M and A, mergers and acquisitions. It's otherwise known as corporate finance. Sometimes people say corporate or company law. M and A um, would be a bit, probably a bit more American, perhaps, but um, very very common use. And when you're looking at an M and A lawyer, you're looking at these key points in the company's life. When I was thinking about what to write in this presentation, I thought, well, perhaps, well, what, what is it that really defines these key events, particularly sort of buying and selling? I'm in your way, I'll get that away again. <laughs> um, you've got the buyer, say, like, you just took a picture in this room, you've got the buyer company, you've got the seller company, you've got, say, two directors for each of the buyer and the seller, you've got a deal team, which means you've got commercial guys in the buyer and the seller. Maybe you've got two young people on the team, so that takes us up to say, we've got eight people on the team already. We've got the principal, the guy who owns it, for each party, so that we've got about 10, 14 people already on the deal team for one of these events. A moderately sized company. We have perhaps parent companies, we have other group companies, so you're looking at 16, 17 separate Entities and people with different interests involved in one of these events for a moderately sized company. You've got banking. If it's an acquisition, there might be a facility to borrow money to make the acquisition. You've got trade financing. So if you're operating a company, you want to borrow money to carry on the business of the company. 
So if you've got a really big deal, you might have two people from the trade section of the bank, two people from the acquisition section of the bank. That's taking us up to 20 people involved in the transaction. You've got lawyers. Every party will have a lawyer. So you've got lawyers acting for the buyer. You've got lawyers acting for the seller. And generally speaking, I'll just pause it. Lawyers are a bit like the sort of dark lords of the Sith in Star Wars. You get the master and you get the apprentice. And they, they share rooms together. And normally the, the master is the one that sits near the window. So everyone that has a lawyer has a senior and a junior lawyer, the master and the apprentice. So you're basically talking about the buyer, lawyer, master and apprentice, the seller's lawyer, master and apprentice, the bank's lawyer, master and apprentice, each individual manager's lawyer, possibly master and apprentice, maybe you lose the apprentice for that one. But you're probably talking about, in a moderate transaction, seven or eight lawyers. We're now beyond the table, we're, on, we're filling up the back seats now with the people in the room as the deal team for this transaction, you've got a financial advisor who's absolutely critical because the financial advisor will determine the price of the target. So you've, you've got a tax advisor which may revise a structure to give you a more optimal tax performance if you're looking at Albert's BVI creativity or even perhaps a European scheme. You've still got some of those, so you've probably got three people from the tax advisor or the financial advisor. It may be the same person, maybe PwC or Deloitte. So we're now filling up to the back now in our room full of the deal team. KPMG and, as well. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. and you've, you've probably got investment banks and brokers that might be trying to mediate the, the, the sale and introduce you to, to parts of the sale and other parties. So essentially what I'm talking about with a moderately sized company is certainly a successful uh, company that's gone through the funding and is looking at that. If we're talking about a big transaction, if we can fill this room with the people and every single person in that room is a leader, it's complex and difficult. The, the key issues in a transaction is primarily why you want to do the transaction and that's generally financial or tax. There may be a strategic one as well, but you fundamentally, even if you want it strategically, it depends on the price. So you need a valuation. Attaching to that valuation, you're looking at what the legal terms of the transfer might be. For example, if you make many, many promises to do something as part of a transaction, it costs money to do those things. And that money is in effect a discount or an addition to the price as well. So the legal terms of a transaction are an integral part of the price. So in, as a transaction, you've got to be at one with the accountant as a lawyer, and as a client, you've got to be at one with the lawyer and the accountants. And generally, when I'm running transactions, I insist on sitting next to the most important guy, the client, and I insist on the accountant being the other side of the most important guy, the client, so that we can both hear each other, because we've got a whole room full of people, and anyone more than two or three people away, you can't really hear. Unless, uh, bear in mind, you've got, what generally happens is somewhat confrontational as well, you've got half the table that's one side lined up, and then the other side comes in and is lined up, on the other side as part of this transaction. So if all goes well with, um, with the sort of entrepreneurial schemes, and you could be in this situation one day where you're faced with this rather intimidating transactional environment, and uh, it's nothing to be scared of really. We're very nice, but there are just lots of people. The, the, key, the key part of the transaction, why is it so complicated? It's because these are critical assets the shares, the property, the key rights, and you need to be certain that you've identified them. You need to be absolutely clear that you have all of the rights to all of the parts of the business that you want to transfer, and you need to make sure that they're passed over. You need to make sure that title is transferable, and you need to inspect that and prove that what you say is worth 50 million euro is really worth 50 million euro, and not only you think that as a seller because you want to sell it for that, but the buyer thinks that too, and they're happy to pay that. And under expert advice, I'm, I'm talking about these things. It brings together the the environment, perhaps not as an immediate startup, but later on. 
And I think that this is the role that, that lawyers really play in, the, in these transactions, that they, they chip in with bits of helpful advice at the beginning in order to prepare the businesses for later on. I mentioned at the end that if all your key people are going into a deal room and banging their heads together until midnight to do a transaction, sometimes the business suffers. So it's a key issue as part of the transaction that the business doesn't suffer to the extent that it needs to. My, my question to myself, as the slide says, is why does a lawyer show up here? Why, is, why do lawyers have to be there? We hate lawyers, we don't like paying them, they're expensive and they're aggressive and they, you know, they come in pairs and like the master and the apprentice. Why do we need them? Basically, we need them because they're damn complex. Transactions are extremely difficult. You're involving parts of company law in the same way that Albert was describing with potentially half a dozen companies with banking facilities coming in that are that thick. Sorry, you should probably confirm that. <laughs> or, or, or more. <laughs> Even more. And that's without the security. You've pledged all your assets. Um, you're dealing with multiple counterparties. Sometimes you're dealing with state entities. Sometimes you're talking about competition or regulated businesses if you're dealing with pharma or communications or things like that. And above all, Every time you add another counterparty, another third party, you've exponentially increased the difficulty of it. And we've just filled a room with 30 or 40 people as our deal team. Um, and when I first came to the Czech Republic in 2004, 10 million was a big deal. Now 100 million is a nice deal. Um, so it, it, it happens. And the room is full of people. It's full of formal process. It's full of complexity. The other reason that people get lawyers is because there's a huge risk. There's a huge amount of money on the table, and that means that if anything happens, that money is seriously depleted. Or sometimes, even with a much smaller deal team, I mentioned all of the personalities in the transaction, but in a smaller deal, those same personalities are combined in a smaller number of people. The roles are still there, but it's smaller. But maybe if somebody's investing in a new country, that in itself is enough to justify a lawyer or a team of lawyers to make sure that uh, the protections are there. So that's my first section, which is about the basics of the transaction. What is it? Why they're difficult? So all that remains is for me to give a huge thanks to Aaron Johnson, course director of the MBA program at the University of New York in Prague. To find out more about the MBA course, please go to www.unypunip.cz. Otherwise, many thanks for listening.